there, and uh, it's been a wonderful four years so far. And uh, <laughs> sorry, there's still something there's something like talking back to me over there. But uh, yeah, it's been a wonderful fourth year, and uh, I just really want to invite you guys to come to campus and, uh, and meet some of our students. You guys had a chance to worship at DSU this past summer, and we want to kind of continue that. Um, for a long time now, we've been trying to drag students over here, but what we've realized is that what we really need is we need grace to come to DSU and invite them to come here personally. Uh, because imagine if over the 12 weeks of the semester, we had 12 families come to DSU on Friday nights at 6.30 p.m. when we meet, and instead of them coming here and feeling uncomfortable because they didn't know anyone, they already met 12 families that they could come and know and feel comfortable with. Last week, uh, Helen Hogan came and met some of our students, some of our young ladies, and uh, she's going to have them over to their house. And um, That's what we're looking for. We're looking for grades to come to DSU and be a bridge to bring those students over here to grades so that they don't feel uncomfortable. Um, it's a big deal when you're a freshman or a sophomore or a new student um, to come to a church and not know them. And uh, everybody here can relate to that. So um, I'm encouraging we have a sign-up sheet. We've got about seven or eight more weeks left in the semester. And uh, even if you don't make it on the sign-up sheet, if every slot is filled up, we want you guys to come. Uh, you can just pop in at 6.30 on Fridays. I won't scare you away. We want you to be there and uh, relate to and get to know some of these wonderful students at Delaware State University. Uh, the next thing is, if you have anybody, a college student, and they're just going to be staring at the ceiling next week, we want you to invite them to our fall conference this next weekend. Uh, the deadline to sign up is late, late Monday night, okay? Um, but the thing is this, they can come totally for free. So there's not a financial barrier to them coming. Uh, we want you to invite them and their friends and to, uh, to make it um, possible for them to, to come to our retreat. If they don't know, they can't come. Um, so we're going to read our text today. Our text today is John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. If you can stand, we're going to read God's word together. All right, God's word reads. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. This is God's word. You may be seated. Um, this past week I had the pleasure of visiting Pastor Kenny. And uh, many of you know he's recovering, the brother's doing well, he's in good spirits. And uh, inevitably, we have a lot of things to talk about, but inevitably we started talking, if you know Pastor Kent, about football. <laughs> and we don't root for this, the, the same team, I'm definitely not a Steelers fan. Uh, but we do have a common enemy. And that common enemy is having a real tough time this year. And in particular, there's one player on that team that is playing real bad. He had a great rookie season, and he came back, and he has experienced what a lot of people like to call the second-year curse. So what is the second-year curse? The second-year curse occurs because the first year, nobody has tape on you. Nobody knows what you're really capable of. Nobody knows what you're going to do. But the second year, they have a whole year of material on you to sit down all summer and dissect exactly what it is you do. You know, they say a good coach and a good player, a good leader on a team, will actually spend more time watching film or tape, uh, depending on which year, with, with, uh, or video, depending on what generation you're from, um, will they spend more time doing that than they actually will on the practice field. So why do they do that? Why do they do that? When you begin to watch film on a player, you start to realize that everybody, and everybody has a pattern. Everyone has a pattern. Some of these patterns are so deep that the players themselves are not even aware of it. 
And in real sense, watching film can give you so much insight into an opponent that you begin to know them more than that person knows themselves. You start to see that, hey, you know what, that running back, he never runs left. So what are we going to do? We're going to load up the right and force him to run left and do something that he never, ever does. When you watch baseball film, you start to realize, you know what, every time that guy gets a curveball, he whips it. So what do you do that guy? You start throwing a curveball, curveball after curveball. And if he never adapts, before he knows it, he's out of the league. He's hitting 195, and uh, he's never been on base, and he's wondering if he's going to make it to the next year. Um, you start watching basketball film, and you realize that, you know what, that point guard can't dribble to his left. So what do you do? You force him to the left every time. Left, left. And if he doesn't adapt, if he doesn't change, he's useless. It works in other games, strategy games. If you've ever watched uh, a poker tournament, you know that people have tells. You know, sometimes when a guy's bluffing, he'll do something funny, like pull on his ear or just his collar. You know, and that's how you know he's got a bluff. If you watch a chess player, over time you'll start to notice his patterns. He might do the same intro every time. And if you can learn how to defeat that intro in his game, you will beat that guy every time. We have patterns. And God, we see in this text that God has been watching our text. God has been watching our text. Moreover, the bigger picture is that we learn that God has made the text. He's in charge of the text. And as a result, we find out that God, that Jesus, knows you and I and everyone who's ever existed better than we even know ourselves. Jesus has you and I and everybody you know all figured out. We can't love Jesus. We can't distract Jesus. We can't trick Jesus. He knows all of our good and our bad habits. The fact that Jesus knows everything about us is perhaps the most frightening and also the most comforting truth about God. This fact is a, is a double-edged sword to a great degree. God is aware of everything you've ever said. He's aware of everything you've ever thought. He's aware of everything you've ever done. He's aware of everything you've neglected to do. And if you believe in Jesus, he still loves you. God doesn't use the tapes to exploit your weaknesses. God uses the tapes to make you better. Unlike these coaches, you have Bill Belichick sitting down ways to, to ruin, trying to figure out a way to ruin your career. God doesn't do that. So here's the big idea. Jesus is Lord, and he knows everything. He knows all. He knows everything about you. But the good news is this. Because he knows everything about us, we are free to follow and trust Him with our, own, our whole heart. Not back of our heart, not in fear, but in knowing that He loves us despite everything He knows. So how can we begin to follow in this Jesus in this way? How can we begin to trust and know Jesus loves us despite our, our shortcomings? The first thing we see in verse 23, 23 is that we need to not only check the text, we need to check the signs. Verse 23 says this, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. When they saw the signs that he was doing. So this is a real short text, but it's a big text. It's a big text. You know, one of the hardest things about uh, being a campus pastor is that you have to, when you're preaching a 
looking for a book like the book of John, the Gospel of John, inevitably you have to pick and choose. I've got 12 weeks. I don't have enough fingers for that. So just imagine 12, okay? I've got 12 weeks to, let, to teach these kids the book, the book of John. Last week, I taught on Jesus turning over the tables. This past week, I, I taught on Nicodemus and Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus. But I had to skip this passage. But as I read this passage, it impacted me in a big way. Why is that? You know, as a pastor, and I'm a young pastor. I haven't been doing this for a long time. You know, there's guys that have been doing this for 40 years. Okay? But you start to learn very quickly, and you start to gather an insight about humanity. And that insight is, is that we do a lot of things have heart. You see it in young people and old people. You see it in church people and unchurched people. You see it in rich and poor people. You see it in the educated and the uneducated. You see it in the poor person and the not poor person. And finally, if you're an honest pastor, you start to see it in yourself. You start to see that many of us are blunt when it comes to what we say we believe. We say we believe one thing, but our actions don't follow. We have a very difficult time. Everyone has a very difficult time simply doing what they say they believe. We have a very hard time. And I'm going to tell you, it's an epidemic. It's not just bound to Americans. It's not just bound to college students, even though they might have a little bit harder time. It's not just bound to uh, working class people or white collar or blue collar, rich people, poor people. We, it is an epidemic. We have a hard time doing what we say. We have a hard time. Not being hypocrites. Verse 23 demonstrates this clearly. It shows us in great detail the reaction people gave Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. The people's reaction in, in regards to Jesus' signs was very, very weak. It was a very shallow reaction. Consider that Jesus just a few days ago, maybe not even that long, had just, imagine this. Imagine a man comes into church. He runs up to the communion table and flips it over. He starts flipping over the chairs. He starts flipping over everything on the stage. And then he starts grabbing the audio cables and literally whipping people in the congregation with the audio cables. He's doing this in church. And he's screaming at them at the top of his voice. And he's saying, don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. In this day and age, what do we call those people? We've got a word for it. We call them terrorists. Jesus is throwing everything out. He's trying to get us like, our, our attention. He is giving us a sign that we need to wake up and look to him. And these people don't take notice. Their reaction is saying, even in comparison to the other people Jesus has come into contact with thus far in the, in the book of John. Andrew and Peter, he comes into contact with them in, in chapter 1. They not only believe John the Baptist preaching about Jesus as the Lamb of God, but they follow the action. They said, Jesus, where do you live? And they spent the whole day with Jesus. And by the time, by the time they left Jesus' home, or wherever he was staying, they were completely convinced that he was the Messiah. And their whole life changed from that moment on. As you read in chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus, when Nicodemus comes into contact with Jesus, he is so impressed, despite the, his high status in Jerusalem, in, in, in the culture, he is so impressed that he has to go to Jesus and ask him more questions. He wants to know everything about Jesus and everything that Jesus can tell him, and he is, he 
is totally changed after this experience. Jesus gave the Passover crowd. We don't know if the sign of, of turning over the tables at the temple was the only sign he gave them, but I'm assuming that he did even more than that. But these people were not moved. Unimaginable. These people come into contact with Jesus, the living Son of God, and then moments later, they continue about their lives. As usual. They came into contact with the very living God. Jesus says that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The Bible says that Jesus is the, the image of the invisible God. These people came into contact with him and it didn't change their lives. It's an amazing thought. That they went about their lives like nothing ever happened. Have you ever been pulled over by a cop? The, the police officer doesn't really give you much of an opportunity to not believe that he's a cop. You know, I can remember uh, not too long ago, I was driving through North Carolina. It's kind of a notorious stretch in North Carolina. When everybody gets pulled over, they give you a big fat ticket. And I'm going home, and I'm just cruising. Maybe I was speeding, maybe I wasn't. But all of a sudden, I see these big, big flashing lights. And I say to myself, you know, this is a sign for something. I should associate this with something. Um, but I just keep driving. I'm like, it can't be for me, right? It, it's not for me. So two miles down the road, the cop speeds up. He rolls down his windows, and he says, pull over right now. And I'm like, oh, so that was for me. That was for me. I saw the sign. I knew what the sign meant. But it didn't change anything. I didn't think the sign was for me. Likewise, the people here see Jesus' miracles. They know what it's pointing to, but they're not taking it seriously. These people had to believe in Jesus in response to Jesus' miracles. They didn't have a choice. They were right there in front of them. There was no space to deny what Jesus was doing. They had to take notice, but what they didn't have to do was change. And many of them did. You know, at DSU, we have signs all over campus. I, I know because I walked with another student on a hot summer day, uh, went to Staples, printed them all out, worked on them all summer, and made sure that it, in big, big, red, bold letters, it said Jesus. Because I wanted everybody to know on campus what we were about, and to make no mistakes about it. But I can tell you, in my four years of doing that, that I only had maybe a handful of students that come to our meeting and say, you know, I came because I saw the sign. Nobody does that. Do you know why people come? People come because not unlike Jesus, we meet in the most obvious place we could possibly meet. We don't hide somewhere at PSU. And I, before we meet, I literally go in and drag people in who look like they're not doing anything. <laughs> and if you happen to be in a place where we're meeting, we're not, we're not waiting for you to leave before we start. We're just going to start. That's what it takes to get our attention sometimes. You know, Jesus' signs are way better than mine. But these people still didn't take Jesus seriously. Are we taking Jesus seriously? Are we noticing Jesus' signs. Have Jesus' signs changed anything for you? Unlike these people, have you really, really, and truly believed in Jesus? The second thing we see, the first thing we saw, we need to check the tapes. The next thing we saw is that we need to, we need to check. Sorry about that. I made my own points there. 
We need to check the signs. The next thing we see is that we need to check our hearts. Verses 24 through 25 show us in a great and maybe one of the most powerful ways the Bible does it. So what is Jesus? We see the people's reaction to Jesus. So what is Jesus' reaction to them? It's really clear. Jesus, in return for their half-heartedness, is actually half-hearted towards them. You know, as a pastor, it's my reaction when I see anybody even remotely interested in Jesus to get, like, really, really excited and to pursue them more. But Jesus here actually turns away a little bit. He turns back. You know, the text says that Jesus did not commit or entrust himself, himself to them. However, the Greek word here is a very simple word. It's the word for believe. You can easily say that Jesus would not, did not believe them, for he knew all men. Jesus didn't believe them. There's, a, there's an odd kind of turn of events. They're saying that they believe Jesus, but Jesus knows better. And Jesus does not believe them. That's, that's a pressing question. Does Jesus believe you? It's kind of a turning of the tables. We're always asked to believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. And we need to. But does Jesus believe you? It's a question that is a question of the heart. Why would Jesus do that? It seems kind of mean, right? Because even Jesus himself says, says that all we need is faith the size of what? A mustard seed. Looking at these people, you would think that they had faith the size of at least a mustard seed. But apparently they don't. John gives us the reason. He says that Jesus knew all men. He knew all men. What does that mean? Does it mean to know all men? Does it mean that Jesus just had a really good, like, intuition? He had, like, a really good gut feeling. Is, is that what it means? Does it mean that Jesus was just a really good guesser? Like, he could really weigh the odds in his head. He was, like, a really good mathematician. He just knew how to guess real good. Does it mean that Jesus would have been the greatest? He would have been bigger than Freud. Does it mean that Jesus would have just been a really good uh, psychologist? That he would have been able to sit down with people and understand them, know where they're coming from? I don't think that's what it means at all. I think it's much bigger than that. It's clearly much bigger than that because in every gospel, there is at least one instance of a similar statement concerning this to very different people. In Mark 2, verse 8, Mark, uh, Jesus said, uh, it says this about Jesus, immediately, Jesus aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves. So, most of the time it just says that Jesus knew, but this time it adds that he was aware in his spirit. Now, there is some controversy here, but I think that this is, Je this is, this is Jesus' divine nature. Active here. This is, this is going beyond Jesus' human nature, but this is Jesus, the divine nature of Jesus, knowing something that only he could know. It's, it's Jesus, the God man. It's, it's what makes Jesus special. It's what's the difference between us and Jesus. We have everything in common with Jesus and nothing in common with Jesus. Jesus is fully man, just like we are. He has the full gamut of human emotions, just like we do. But we don't know all men. Like this verse is saying that Jesus knows all men. <laughs> You know, the other night, um, me and the students after our meeting, we went to Starbucks, and uh, it was just a few of us, and if you know anything about pastors, we are never fully satisfied. Like, 
the only thing that would have really made me satisfied with this, with this little bitty post meeting to Starbucks is that if every DSU student was there. That's the only way I would have been happy. Somebody said, so hey man, when are you gonna you know, move on to the next campus? I said, when everybody at DSU is safe. I mean, that's just the way pastors feel. Like, that's just the way I feel about it. Like, I'll move on to another campus when everybody hears a Christian. Period. But so I, so I said, hey guys, what can we do to get people excited about hanging out as a group after our meetings? Because one thing I really want to build into our community is this idea of fellowship. We need to hang out. We need to be friends. We need to grow with one, to, uh, with one another. We need to become closer as a group. And unanimously, my students said this. They said, you know, honestly, I think everybody just wants to go back to their room. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> almost fell out of the chair and said, you know what? That's exactly what I'm trying to direct. You guys are real good at going back to your room. I want to get you out of that. I want to develop you out of that. I want to do something different. I want to change the culture because, yeah, you guys are real good at going back to your room. And, you know, that at that point, I thought about this text. And I said, man, you know what? I really wish that I knew all men. I, I really wish that I just kind of knew what people were thinking. Because it really throw me off sometimes. And I said, you know, when I was in college, stayed in my room, but you know, when I was in college, and I'm really kind of showing my age, we didn't have internet in our dorms. Like, I didn't have a personal computer. I had to go to the library and like type my stuff. They still had typewriters in the library. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real. You know, we had like floppy disks and things going on. And then y'all were like, whatever, you know, but like, that was kind of a long time ago. Like, but, I, at that point, I said, I, I really wish that I could be like Jesus. But here's the thing. Jesus alone has this power because I'm going to tell you, if I did know everything about what was going on in everybody's heart, it wouldn't make my job any easier. It would actually make my job much more difficult. If you knew everything about what was going on in everybody's heart, nobody in here would have a prayer. <laughs> We would be scared to death of everybody. <laughs> this is why we need Jesus to, to take over this for us because when we really look inside our hearts, what we find there is not to pray. And oftentimes it can be very scary. What's in your heart? Are you being honest about what's in your heart? Or are you saying to yourself, no way I can be racist. No way. Not a chance. No way I can be a sexist. No way. No way I can be an elitist. It's not. Not a chance. No way I can be a, you know, somebody, a, a, a cultural elitist. You know, I don't want anybody here that doesn't like my culture. You know, no way would I look down at those kids over there. When we really look at our hearts, what do you really see? If Jesus told you what was in your heart, would you believe it? Would you believe it? You know, there's this Latin term, this old theological Latin term, it's called quorum day. It's this idea that everything we do, have done, or will ever do is not just known by God, but it's before, it's right before God's face. That's what the term means. Before God's face. It's as if God has a pair of eyes going around with you everywhere. Like I said earlier, it's the most frightening thought, and it's also the most comforting thought when you know that you have a loving God who 
who loves you despite all of those shortcomings. Jesus can take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. He can take those dark thoughts and those thoughts you wouldn't want anyone to know about and change them into thoughts of love, hope, and peace. If you believe in Jesus, you can begin to know Jesus just like he knows you. And the more you know Jesus, the more you will become like Jesus. You will change. The Holy Spirit will make sure of that if you believe in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you love us so much that you love us in spite of our shortcomings, Lord. Your word says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Father, we are still sinners, Lord. We still have hearts that are wavering and unstable and half-hearted. But Lord, because you loved us first, we can have hope that despite all of that, that you will still love us until you return. Praise the Lord.